This hemiacetal is what we get after the first alcohol is attacked, but before the second alcohol is attacked. Okay, so that should be where it is This is a logical name. It's got the name acetal in it because we started with an aldehyde, but it's called hemi because we were only halfway through the reaction. We're only halfway through the reaction, so this would be a hemi acetal. Notice that what's the big difference between the hemi acetal and the full acetal? Well, since we're only halfway through, the carbonyl oxygen is still around here. Here, the carbonyl oxygen is still around, whereas with the full acetal, the carbonyl oxygen has left. Here's what happened to the carbonyl oxygen that left as water. But at this point, the carbonyl oxygen hadn't left yet. So the hemiacetal still has the former carbonyl oxygen. It's just turned into an OH group. And the full acetal, the carbonyl oxygen, has left. On the other hand, suppose that we had started with a ketone. Well, then this wouldn't be called an acetal. It would be called a ketal. And then what would be a logical name for this? Hemiketal. You got it. Then this would be a hemiketal. So those are those four names, acetal, ketal, and hemiacetal, hemiketal. The final product here is either a full acetal or a full ketal, depending on whether you started with an aldehyde or a ketone. But the product halfway through, when only the first alcohol has attacked and that carbonyl oxygen is still around, is a hemiketal or a hemiacetal. So are the, um, when we're looking at our ketal or acetal, are the two nucleophiles that attack always the same? Let's see, they're always oxygens. So the only time that we would use these terms acetal and ketal is when you have, is when you have alcohols attacking. Oh, okay. The only time we would use these names acetal and ketal is when we have alcohols attacking. That's a good question. I should have pointed that out. There are other nucleophiles that would have similar reactions, but we wouldn't use the terminology of acetal and ketal for those. Acetal and ketal and hemiacetal and hemiketal are only for these alcohol attacks on aldehydes and ketones. Now, this whole reaction that we've gone through here is reversible. These rea this reaction is reversible. It can go either way. And that's the reason why your instructor likes to call acetals and hemiacetals and hemiketals and, hemike and hemiacetals, he likes to call those hidden carbonyls. He likes to call these hidden carbonyls because, because this is reversible, you can turn them into carbonyls. Hemiacetals and hemiketals and full ketals and full acetals, all of those can be turned into carbonyl carbons. So they can be turned into carbonyl carbons. We haven't seen how to do that yet, but they can all be turned into carbonyl carbons. Okay. So how can you recognize these if you're seeing them in a problem? How would you recognize this? Well, remember the hidden carbonyls are when we have a carbon bonded to two electronegative atoms. Hidden carbonyls are when we have a single carbon bonded to two electronegative atoms. That's what we have in both of these pictures, right? Here's a single carbon bonded to two electronegative atoms, and here's a single carbon bonded to two electronegative atoms. Now, how can you tell that you have acetals and ketals, or hemiacetals or hemiketals? That's when the carbon is bonded to two oxygens. Acetals and ketals and hemiacetals and hemiketals, those all apply when you have a single carbon bonded to two separate oxygens. If we have a single carbon bonded to two separate oxygens, it's either a hemiacetal or a hemiketal or a full acetal or a, feet or a full ketal. A single carbon bonded to two separate oxygens is one of those four things. Usually. Do 
oxygens also have to be bonded to an alkyl group? Or? To an alkyl group? Well, notice in this case, this oxygen is not bonded, bonded to an alkyl group. But if true, uh, at least one of them has to have an alkyl group. That's right. I didn't mention that, but at least one of them has to have an alkyl group. Otherwise, it couldn't have come from an alcohol. Remember, these are produced when alcohols attack. Well, here's the alcohol oxygen that attacked. Let's go back to the idea of the proton transfer. Remember that what we did is we had the sulfate take the proton off of this nucleophile, and then we had the sulfate put the proton onto the carbonyl oxygen. But we saw that we could have done, and in the future we're going to do a shortcut. In the future we're just going to go straight from this picture to this picture. We're just going to have this oxygen steal the proton from this oxygen. The reason I didn't want to do that this time, though, is that if you do that, you never draw the hemiacetal or the hemiketal. The hemiacetal or the hemiketal is what you get in the middle of that proton transfer. Right? If we had just gone straight from here to here, this wouldn't quite look like a hemiketal. Right. You, would, you could call it a protonated hemiketal, but it's not a normal hemiketal or hemiacetal like we have here. So I wanted to do one case without the proton transfer so we can actually see the hemiacetal or the hemiketal. Mm -hmm. um, if we just go straight from here to here, then you'll, you won't quite get the neutral hemiacetal or hemiketal. We'll just go straight to the protonated version over here. It's important to realize, remember that in these reactions, the carbonyl oxygen has left, and here it's leaving as water. In this reaction, this is leaving as water. So it's good to still put this asterisk here to show this is gone. So when would you use this for synthesis? Well, suppose that you saw, again, something like this. Hopefully you would say, aha, this is a hidden carbonyl, a carbon with two separate oxygens. And you have to ask yourself how to make this. One of the key things is, um, what type of nucleophile do you need to have to make this? An alcohol. That's right. However, notice it doesn't look like an alcohol anymore because it's, it's lost its H. And this really messes people up when they're doing syntheses. This doesn't look like an alcohol anymore, so they don't remember that the way to make this is by adding an alcohol. So you have to remember that after an alcohol attacks, it loses its proton and it doesn't look like an alcohol anymore. And then it can be hard to realize that you had to use an alcohol in the first place to make that. So we have to realize that after alcohols attack, they don't look like alcohols anymore because they've deprotonated. But we still use alcohols to make these types of functional groups. Does that make any sense? All right, so this really is a pretty complicated reaction. Let's go through the mechanism for this reaction. Does this look like it's going to be the same as what we did before? Yes. Pretty much the same, because we've got an aldehyde or a ketone, and acid-catalyzed conditions, and an alcohol. Because this is complicated, you should go ahead and feel free to just follow along in the handout here at the bottom of page one, so that we know what we're doing each step, if you get lost anyway. That's a good start. Just as a minor technicality, this is the best way to draw sulfuric acid. You actually should show the structure so you can see that the negative charge ends up on the oxygen. But that was a good start. That's a minor technicality. And that's a good step. 